At the end of our last segment, I talked about the ingredients of the opera. And I was only able to get through a couple of things, but they were probably some of the most important ones, the recitative and the aria. So I hope you were able to listen to Renee Fleming's performance of Let the Bright Seraphim so that you could hear how an ABA form aria progresses. And so today, when the A section is altered by the soprano, it's called ABA prime. The other things that are necessary for uh, a whole opera is ensemble music, where you might have a duet or a trio. Now for the Baroque period, the focus was on the individual soloist. So you wouldn't have ensemble music, but it was used rather sparingly. Beyond a trio, then the waters got a little bit muddied and you couldn't understand and hear uh, with great clarity what each individual was bringing to the table. Everybody was very interested in finding out who was the best singer in that particular opera house's ensemble. So ensembles were used uh, rather sparingly, but they were used. The choruses were there. Oftentimes the chorus utilized the role as a Greek chorus. Then there was also a moment for the orchestra. The overture which precedes the actual drama is um, a number just for the orchestra. The Baroque orchestra had about 20 members in it and the overture came in one of two different ways. It was either a French overture or an Italian overture. Now these two overtures are very important. They are predecessors to the coming symphony which will uh, gel and come into practice in the classic period. So I want you to be aware of what all the French and the Italian overture consist of. A French overture has two sections. It starts off with a slow dotted rhythm pattern section that then goes into a fast section which is in the form of a fugue. So the opening slow section has bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum as its rhythm and that rhythm is consistent through the whole slow movement. Then when we go into the fugue, the fast fugue, a fugue is a fancy word for a, a round. It's a little bit more detailed than that. But you'll hear a melody in one voice, say in the trumpets, and then a few measures later you're going to hear that same melody now in the violins. A few measures later, say, um, in one of the woodwind instruments. And so it's passed around within the orchestra, but the melody is still always present. A great example of a French overture is the overture to Handel's Messiah. And that will be something that I'll ask you to listen to later on. The other overture is an Italian overture and it does not have any specific ingredients. It just has three sections. It begins fast, has a slow middle section, and then it ends fast again. So fast, slow, fast is its tempo variation as it goes through the three sections. And then the other term that I have here for you is libretto. And libretto is the Italian word for text. Oftentimes these um, composers would work with a librettist, somebody who would take a text and they may edit that text or alter the text a little bit to help the musician as they're putting their text to the different melodies that they have churning in their head. So all of this together now is what we need to create an opera. The recitatives and the arias and the ensembles and the chorus beginning with a, one of the two types of overtures with the uh, libretto, with the text at the center because the music has to bring that text to life through word painting as much as possible. Now let's take a look at opera in terms of a couple of the different countries. We'll start first with Italy since that's where it begins. Opera in Italy changes a great deal because of the huge economic success of opera. In the beginning was the Florentine Camerata and they had Claudio Monteverdi and they were wanting great dramatic interest, lots of word painting, lots of character development. But because of the huge success of opera, and in particular, the huge success and demand to watch the castrati perform, the drama was kind of pushed to the side and composers were forced to create 
aria after aria after aria after aria and put it together and call it an opera, even though it's really not a true opera in the sense of bringing a story, a drama to life. So we have the epitome of the final period of the Baroque composer as Alessandro Scarlatti, who wrote over a hundred operas, and they're very, very rarely performed. Usually you hear Scarlatti's music in recital, because that's basically what he was creating, was solo music. It wasn't tied together by a great dramatic thread. So it changes a lot as we go through the 150 years in Italy. I also want to mention uh, the French style of opera. Remember the French, were the, they were the one country that's not going to be ruled by the Italians. They're going to create their own serious opera in their own language. So they went so far as to name it something different. They weren't going to call it serious opera. They called it the lyric tragedy. The lyric tragedy had to be a, a serious story, had heroic adventure, and it also has to have a sumptuous dance scene. They wanted a big ballet scene. The French always have been lovers of the ballet. And so if the ballet can be included in any of their music, then they do so. And so we see that uh, in evidence with their lyric tragedy. The composer of note from France is Jean-Baptiste Lully. Lully is actually the creator of uh, the French overture and his operas are still performed in France and in French-speaking Canada. In England, I almost could bypass this, but there's a couple of ideas that I want to make note of. English opera, uh, there's not a great deal of examples from English-born composers uh, that are of great note, but there's one composer that's very important. His name is Henry Purcell. And during his lifetime, he wrote a lot of hybrid forms of operas called masks. The mask was for um, aristocratic entertainment. And instead of being taken, text being taken from uh, mythological legends or historical events, the text here is taken from poetry. So it rhymed often, and therefore it was deemed on a little higher level, but it still has the recitatives and arias and all the different forms that we've just gone through. Purcell only wrote one opera, but that one opera has a very strange um, story to it. Purcell was helping out with a girls' school in London, and he was astonished when he visited the school that they really didn't know a lot about opera. Opera was this huge deal for the Baroque period, so he decided how better to educate them about opera than to have them perform one. So he composed a one-act opera called Dido and Aeneas for them. So he wrote it in English because it was really just going to be this education tool. But became very, very popular, so they just grandfathered it in. They didn't make Purcell go back and rewrite it in the Italian language since it was a very serious opera. But that's how it has its beginnings. Very short 45, 50-minute opera about the Carthaginian queen Dido, who says in the beginning that she loves Carthage so much that she has no room left over in her heart to take a male suitor. But then rides into town Aeneas, the Trojan prince, and he woos the beautiful Dido and falls instantly in love with her until Dido says, you know, I do have a little room left over in my heart after all. So now uh, Dido and Aeneas are planning uh, their union, their wedding. But Dido's love for her kingdom is not echoed by everybody there. There's a group of sorcerers and witches who despise Dido, and they're very, very um, scared by the fact that Aeneas may come into the picture because that's just going to strengthen her stranglehold over Carthage. So they want to see Aeneas get the heck out of Dodge. So what they do is they conjure up this curse, and usually they use like a, a big cauldron, big kettle, and come, come up with this witch's brew. But anyway, uh, the curse arises in the mist, and the mist lands on Aeneas, and Aeneas must feel instantly compelled to leave Dido and go conquer more kingdoms for his father's kingdom of Troy. And it works. So Aeneas bids Dido farewell 
and says, don't forget me while I'm gone, basically. And so Dido watches as Aeneas leaves her. And now she's so heartbroken, and this is opera to the hilt. She's going to die now of a broken heart. And so Dido calls to her hand servant Belinda and says, Thy hand, Belinda, on thy bosom let me rest. More I would, but death invades me. Death is now a welcome guest. She sings that in a seco or dry recitative. And it's interesting as you delve into European literature that a lot of the writers feel that death is not an event like we think of in our life, but they think of it as a persona, an actual some sort of creature or, or something that comes for you. So when Dido calls upon death and says, death is now a welcome guest, death comes and abides with Dido as she sings her aria. When I am laid in earth, may my wrongs create no trouble in thy breast. Remember me, remember me, but ah, forget my fate. And she's singing this text underneath her in the accompaniment is a ground bass statement. Let me tell you what a ground bass is. A ground bass is a compositional device where you have this repeating bass line figure and it repeats over and over again throughout an entire composition. So in this particular case, it's an aria. Purcell uses this ground bass statement as the personification, as the musical adaptation, as the word painting for death. Death is now a welcome guest. Death then comes to her in this ground-based statement, and it echoes and repeats all these different times as she sings the aria. She dies at the end of the aria, and then the end of the opera is her servants taking uh, Dido's body to the pier to be burned as her, her final sacrifice. So that ends the opera. But Dido's Lament is what this is referred to, this recitative and aria. So I would like for you to listen to this. This song is going to be on your listening exam. So please refer to your listening exam list and uh, listen to this and pay attention for the word painting. Pay attention to the personification of death and the beginning and throughout the whole of the aria and the ground-based statement. <laughs> 